Hello. Maureen, thank you very much for introducing me, and it's always great to have a really good friend tell the story. Thank you. <laughs> Distinguished guests and fellow board members and members of the Parhamovich family and NDI supporters and friends, good afternoon to everybody. I am truly delighted to be here, and I want to thank our new president, Derek Mitchell, and Sherry Bryan, and Sandra Pepper, and James Vanderklok, and the outstanding NDI team for all the work that was put into today. And I also want to thank all of our very generous supporters for your belief in NDI's mission, which is today more important than ever. I also want to say thank you to Ken Wallach, who is here with us today, who has brought NDI to what it is. Thank you very much, Ken. <laughs> Uh, this luncheon is always one of my favorite events, and that has nothing at all to do with its name. Uh, <clears throat> rather, it's because each year we get to hear from uh, celebrated and talented and courageous kick-ass women. Um, and I can think uh, uh, that we can all agree that this has already been one of our best gatherings. The members of the record-breaking class of 2018 have brought new energy and new perspectives to Washington, and I'm so delighted that we got to hear from Representatives Helen and Spannenberger, and I thank them for coming and for the difference that they are making every day on our behalf. And Madam Deputy Prime Minister, thank you so much for your remarks and your leadership in a country that is very dear to all of us. And you gave me this pin in Ukrainian, the women fighting there, so thank you very much. <laughs> Um, as um, Secretary of State, I designated Ukraine as one of the five countries that were most important to the success of democracy globally. But its importance is even more magnified today, five years after Russia's invasion of Crimea and the East. And we need to do everything possible to support the Ukrainian people, and I'm proud of the work that NDI is doing on the ground uh, to help strengthen uh, their democratic institutions. You heard earlier about the establishment of the new Disrupt Her Coalition, and I'm delighted that NDI is partnering on this important new initiative, which will open new pathways to civic leadership for girls and young women. And you also heard the theme of this year's luncheon is celebrating risk takers for women's empowerment. Although I never ran for public office, which is something I truly regret because I was not sure that anybody would like me, uh, <laughs> as a public servant, I was no stranger to risk. So during the Clinton administration, I dealt with many risks, but two stick out in my mind. The first was a wardrobe crisis. In May 1997, we were at a meeting in Paris celebrating NATO, and I was talking to the foreign minister sitting next to me and I noticed all of a sudden that I had spilled salad dressing all over my skirt. At which point, somebody came up and said, we are going to have a family picture, and since you're the only woman, you're going to stand in the middle. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I had this brilliant idea that I would get up. Well, at first I tested to see that the waistband was loose enough that I would get up and turn my skirt around. Uh, <laughs> The risk was that the slit up the back was higher than it should be. <laughs> anyway, it worked. <laughs> uh, uh, the, and by the way, Henry Kissinger couldn't have done that. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the second risk was obviously much more serious and consequential and involved issues of war and peace in Kosovo. These events have been on my mind because they unfold 20 years this spring. And let me briefly put some context on it. In 1998, violence had erupted in what was then the Yugoslav province of Kosovo between ethnic Albanians who were eager to assert their rights and the Serbs who saw the province as a key to their own identity and history. For months, we tried to negotiate a peaceful settlement. Ultimately, the Albanians said yes, but the Serbs said no, and began massing troops in preparation for an attack. Their plan, according to the information that we had, was to kill or drive out the Albanian population through a campaign of ethnic cleansing and terror. With Russia wielding a veto over any action by the Security Council, 
I argued that NATO should act, and President Clinton agreed, and so did our allies. The night before the hostilities began on March 23rd, the President called me the same time he usually did around 1 a.m. because he never slept and didn't think anybody else needed to. And he said, we're doing the right thing, right? And I said, I said yes, Mr. President, we are. And so, at incredibly hard as it was, we sent armed American forces into harm's way. We knew it was necessary, but we couldn't know how it would turn out. And as it happened, the early days were brutal. Milosevic's thugs swarmed into Kosovo and began burning villages and murdering civilians. And for the first time since World War II, we saw horrible pictures of people in Europe being loaded into trains like cattle. But the weather was bad, so many of our planes couldn't fly. And then the Serbs put out various decoys. And then on May 7th, 1999, 20 years ago, just yesterday, I came into my office and my executive assistant said, sit down. I said, what's the matter with you? He said, just sit down. As I said, really? He said, sit down. I said, what is the matter? And he said, we just bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade by mistake. Uh, by that time, the critics were out in force and pouring from all directions. And at that point, they did call it Madeline's War. Um, then, when I started telling friends that the reason I looked fatter was that I had grown thicker skin. <laughs> Through it all, the president was remarkably steady, and so was our team. And we all worked feverishly to keep the alliance together. In time, the weather improved and our airstrikes became effective. And finally, Milosevic had no alternative but to yield. His troops departed, and more than a million Kosovo refugees were able to return home. I was very proud soon thereafter to go to Pristina, the capital, to visit and to hear chants of gratitude for NATO and USA, USA, USA. And I was equally proud when in the spring of 2011, an independent Kosovo elected its first female president. Kosovo today remains a place of testing for democracy, and that's why I'm proud that NDI is on the ground, as we are in more than 60 countries helping to support peace, democracy, and women's empowerment. These efforts do, stay, uh, do continue to face stiff headwinds, not only in Kosovo, but around the world. By the way, I have to say, um, they didn't call it Madeline's War when we won, but the thing that, that happened was there is a whole generation of little girls in Kosovo whose first name is Madeline. Um, um, at our luncheon today, we've celebrated women who are going somewhere, and all of them have risked their personal and professional reputations for the betterment of others. And it is now my pleasure to honor another great risk taker. At NDI, we know that democracy is sustainable only when women do play a leadership role in the economic and political life of a country, just as the Vice Prime Minister said. We agree on many, many things, and that is definitely it. And we know that women's activism has been essential to positive social change, not only in the developing world, but right here in the United States. Few women in recent years have transformed American society as much as our honoree, Tarana Burke. For more than 25 years, Ms. Burke has worked at the intersection of racial justice, arts and culture, and sexual violence, creating and leading campaigns focused on increasing access to resources and support for un underserved um, communities. Ms. Burke's fight against inequality started early in her life, and as a young girl, Growing up in the Bronx, she began organizing around issues of racial discrimination, housing inequality, and economic justice. In college, she organized and advocated on behalf of equal voting rights for all, and in 2003, she co-founded Just Be Incorporated, an organization committed to the leadership, development, and wellness of black girls. After far too many encounters with young people whose lives were affected by sexual violence, she realized how many were suffering through abuse without access to resources, safe spaces, and support. The movement she founded was born out of the need to fill that void. In 2006, she began working with students using Me Too as a tool for healing, education, and action. 
In the years following, the Me Too movement quickly expanded beyond young people to include all marginalized groups. As Tarana says, Me Too is not a women's movement, and indeed, just as all groups are affected by sexual violence, this movement depends on allies from all sectors of society to uphold its commitment to creating the world we all want, one in which no person lives in constant fear of harm from another for speaking truth about past experiences. I deeply admire Tarana Burke's courage and her willingness to take risks on behalf of values that are fundamental to NDI's mission, and so I'm pleased to ask you to join me in welcoming her as the recipient of NDI's 2019 Madeleine K. Albright Award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 